Good morning. Welcome to the COVID-19 weekly media briefing. I'm Carrie Schutte, the Public Information Officer for the Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency. We'll start with our numbers. We've had a total of 7,918 confirmed cases, including 28 from Sunday and 98 from Monday. We've done a total of 106,617 negative tests for a total of 114,535 tests. We have 42 people who are hospitalized, including four in the intensive care unit. We have an estimated 417 active cases and 7,428 people who've been released from isolation to date. Our available regional ICU capacity, which is for Shasta County and 10 other counties in the Northern California region, is 27.9% as of yesterday's report. And we have had 73 people who have died from COVID in Shasta County, 73 Shasta County residents who have died from COVID. Um, today with us, we have Robin Shurek. She is the public health director for the Shasta County Health and Human Services Agency and Dr. Karen Ramstrom, who is our health officer. We have Mark Mitchelson from Shasta Regional Medical Center and Dean Germano from Shasta Community Health Center. Uh, Robin, would you like to get us started today? Sure, thank you. Good morning. As was reported yesterday, our latest weekly case rate and test positivity rate are both down, which is good news. But with New Year's Eve happening tomorrow night, we're hoping that people will continue to avoid gatherings. We know that people are eager to say goodbye to the year 2020, but please do so at home with your household members. We really need people to continue to stay home as much as possible. And when you do go out, Wear a mask, keep at least six feet of distance between you and people from outside your household, and wash your hands frequently. And also get tested. If you're leaving your house regularly to go to work or for other reasons, even if you think that you and others around you are doing a good job of wearing your masks and keeping your distance, there's always a possibility that you could be exposed anytime that you're around other people. So it's a good idea to get tested on a regular basis. Testing helps bring our test positivity rate down, and it can also adjust our case rate down, which could eventually help us get out of the purple tier. We're still a long ways away from that point as our current case rate is 29.9 cases per day per 100,000 population, and it would have to be less than seven in order for us to move out of purple and back into the red. So we're a ways away, but we're headed in the right direction if we continue to mask, distance, avoid gathering, and get tested. All right, thank you, Robin. Dr. Ramstrip, do you have anything to start with today? I do. Thank you, Carrie. Good morning, everybody. Um, I thought I'd provide an update on what's happening with COVID-19 vaccination in our county. Uh, we're making steady progress through phase 1A, um, tier one. And just to remind folks, phase 1A really focuses on our healthcare personnel as well as our um, residents in skilled nursing facilities, uh, assisted living and other long-term care facilities. Um, we um, have allocated vaccine to all of our hospitals, um, and so and some of them are actually going to be getting uh, be, be uh, starting their second uh, dose um, series next week. So that's very exciting. Um, also next week, the CDC pharmacy partnership begins. Um, um, that's a program that many of our uh, long-term care facilities have signed up with, um, where they will partner with either CVS or Walgreens to come in and have their pharmacists come in and vaccinate their staff and their residents. And so um, we're pleased to see that we're scheduled to begin in some of our facilities next week, and that will continue to roll out over the, over the following weeks. Um, we're currently focused on um, getting our medical first responders, um, paramedics and EMTs, um, um, signed up to get vaccinated. Um, some of the hospitals have taken care of some of the paramedics, which we're thankful for. Um, but now we're really reaching out to our various um, um, fire departments to get their medical personnel enrolled. Um, we are um, really appreciative of Shingletown Medical Center and Mayor's Memorial Hospital um, out in East County. They are um, adopting some of those individuals and getting them vaccinated. Um, so that's really, um, really very, very helpful to us. Um, we are uh, scheduled to meet with our two dialysis clinics um, in the next day or two and uh, hope to be able to get them um, going next week. Um, we're very thankful for our partnership with Shasta Community Health Center and I um, have another planning call today and we're hoping that um, those clinics will start next week and um, then we'll be able to uh, refer over and work with the facilities as we walk down through the rest of tier one and tier two and tier three and 
um, get them organized to um, get over to those clinics to get vaccinated. Um, in addition, we're going to be working with Hill Country, um, uh, also very appreciative of their um, partnership to uh, assist with vaccinating the uh, personnel and residential substance use disorder and behavioral health facilities. Those are also in tier one. Um, to plug away, um, you know, it, it might not be happening happening as quickly as we like, but um, you know, we're taking our time to do it correctly, um, handling this vaccine um, so that we're going to make sure it's it's effective. Um, we're doing it in a safe manner, and um, really having to work with these partners to get in the arms of of our healthcare personnel. Um, and so um, happy to answer any questions. Um, that's where we are today. All right, thank you, Dr. Ramstrom. Mark or Dean, do you have anything you'd like to start with before we go to media questions? I, I, I would just add that um, I would call this morning, we, we understand at SRMC there were uh, I think three patients that have both influenza and COVID. So uh, I think the influenza factor is now starting to enter into the mix and uh, which just goes under underscore the need for people to get their flu shots if they haven't gotten them already. All right, thank you. That's an important message. We haven't repeated that one in a while. We'll get that in this week. Um, Okay, anything else before we get started with media questions? Hearing none, we are ready for your questions, media partners. Uh, uh, Dr. Randstrom, you had mentioned a uh, some sort of partnership with CVS Pharmacy and an, uh, another pharmacy at, to, um, to inoculate the long-term care residents. Are those the Pfizer vaccine uh, um, doses that are uh, that are at Mercy or is that a, a different batch? Right, so that's actually a federal program um, that the CDC is managing and um, it's Pfizer vaccine. And what's happening is at the, the national level, um, the CDC is kind of take, you know, they, they know how many programs are signed up in each state. And so they're sort of taking off the top of the state's allocation, the doses of those Pfizer um, for, this partnership program to uh, get the long-term care facilities vaccinated. And so um, it is out of our county allocation um, indirectly um, because it's taken off from the state's supply. And, um, and so you'll, we'll see over time that our Pfizer weekly allocations will vary depending on um, if they're being pushed out to, for these skilled nursing facility um, vaccinations. And so we'll see those go up um, later um, but right now, those doses are primarily going to um, to this CDC pharmacy partnership program for the long-term care facilities, as well as um, to our hospitals at this point. Um, and those second doses um, that are coming next week for the hospitals, those are our second series of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, I assume that's being done on site at the nursing, the skilled nursing facilities. And how is that? How are they able to handle that? How long can that stuff? survive outside of the super cold storage right so there's parameters that are um, um specified by the manufacturer by pfizer on how to handle that vaccine it comes frozen and so these pharmacists they manage um and um cold storage and this type of of um 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 biologic medication if you will and uh, on a regular basis and so they have to thaw it and then they'll go into the facility and um, they have, uh, once it's, um, once that vaccine is thawed, there's, you have 120 hours um, that you can refrigerate that and, um, and use that and have it um, be effective in that period of time, about five days. Other questions? Well, I've got a question for uh, Dr. Ramstrom as well. Um, do, do you mentioned that you are things are not getting rolled out maybe quite as fast as people would like, but you want to do it right. You want to do it safely. Is that more the limiting factor, or is it still the 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 number of of doses that you have available to you, or both? 
You know, it, it's really both. Um, I think things are really going to pick up in the next week or two once we get um, Shasta Community Health Center clinics going on, on a regular basis. We're going to be doing some um, some um, of these vaccinations in our own clinic um, periodically, kind of at a regular interval. Um, we're figuring out the day of the week, that kind of a thing, um, where we will invite certain groups. And so once we get those going, I think we'll we'll see it pick up a little bit. Um, but you're right, our supply is not definitely not enough for all of um, phase one A yet. And so, um, you know, I think I think we're I think we're fine. We're OK. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to make real, some really good progress in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. I, I would just add uh, to that a little bit. Um, most of my staff, my non-hospital based providers, for example, clinicians, as well as my nursing and support staff are in the tier two category. So we have an interest in helping to get the tier one covered so that we can get to our staff. And I think that's true of a lot of the outpatient based providers out there. And then, of course, the next step is how do we get to the general public after that? So, uh, you know, everyone is, pro I think, properly motivated. I think we're limited right now by the supply issues, and uh, but we are starting to get our workforce sort of ready to uh, to to you know to assist in this process because we're all motivated to get this done. Thanks, Dean. Other questions. Good morning. It's Anna here from Channel Twelve. Um, I just want to ask. You know, it sounds like the UK has approved emergency use of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. Um, can we expect the state to be receiving some some of that vaccine as well? Yeah, you know, and I haven't looked for a while to see where that is in our in the FDA approval process, but it will have to go through our own um, process here in the United States. And I just want to, you know, kind of get your perspective this on on this too, Dr. Ranstrom, you know, um, we have two vaccines already here that have already claimed they have 95% effectiveness, while AstraZeneca says it's about 70% effective. Um, from your take, should we just stick to the Moderna and Pfizer or, you know, welcome in another vaccine? You know, I think more options, the better, because we're going to learn over time about um, how these vaccines perform in different types of populations. Um, we will um, learn about how long they last, um, and that may vary across vaccine. So I think the more options we have available that we can continue to um, monitor um, outcomes with in terms of, you know, whether people, um, you know, get COVID infection, um, the better. And, um, you know, there's just still so much to be um, learned in terms of whether a vaccine prevents a person from being able to transmit it to somebody else, or does it just prevent that person from getting sick if they get the infection? So, um, we're 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 the the more tools in our toolbox, the better. And so, um, we'll continue to learn. And I think that's great to have another option coming along. We don't know um, for sure that the supply chain. You know, we're hoping that the supply chain for the Moderna and Pfizer will continue. Um, but we, we need a variety of options available to us to ensure we can continue to vaccinate our population. Thank you for that. And I just wanted to touch up on something. Um, Dean kind of mentioned it earlier, but you know, men, talking about how, getting your flu shot and you know, along with COVID, talk to me a little bit too about the importance of having that flu shot now and that's efficacy versus these COVID vaccines we're seeing out there, if either one wants to comment on it. Well, you know, we did a big push in trying to get influenza um, vaccinations early this year because we knew we were going to have to deal with the COVID vaccination. And so um, certainly people can still get their, their influenza vaccine, and we recommend people do if they haven't already. You know, you can go to your provider or your local pharmacy. Um, and so highly encourage people to do that. Um, and then if they end up being in one of the groups that are due for the COVID vaccine, there just needs to be two weeks in between the two vaccines. Um, that's what's recommended currently um, by the FDA and these um, uh, by Pfizer and Moderna. So 
Um, we continue, we recommend influenza vaccination every year because that, that virus shifts a little bit. And so you want to make sure that you have the best coverage for those particular, um, the way that the virus um, looks that year. And so, um, yeah, we highly encourage people to get vaccinated. And just to be, I'm sorry. And just to be clear, the flu vaccine isn't, you know, something that could necessarily fight the co coronavirus, correct? Because it's not, would, I wouldn't say it's like the same strain. It's a different virus completely. Influenza is influenza virus. And then the, as you know, the SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. It's a different, completely different virus, completely different vaccine. Like you have a different vaccine for measles, for example. You have a different vaccine for rubella. You have a different vaccine for pertussis. There are different organisms. Thank you. And then also just wanted to ask about AstraZeneca again to you. I know you said you haven't looked into it uh, as of recently, but to you, 70%, does that seem to be promising compared to the 95% of Pfizer and Moderna? You know, I think we need to wait and look at those, um, look at the data from those trials and, um, and see what it looks like. And, you know, it may be that it performs better in certain populations than others. And so, um, you know, our, the FDA's, um, Advisory committee will look at that, dive, dive into the data like they have for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, and we'll see what we learn and um, share what we know when that when that information is available. From from what I've uh, read recently on it, uh, it has some advantages, particularly in the distribution and management. It doesn't require super chilling and those kinds of things, so it may, in certain circumstances, be more useful um, than. Uh, than, for example, Pfizer and all the handling that goes on. And, and I think the data is still being reviewed. So that number 70 could change. And it could change, as Do uh, Dr. Ranstrom said, with targeted populations as well. So I think we have to wait till all the data is in and the, the FDA and the CDC have to take a look at it. Any other questions? Sorry, I have a couple more. This one, um, I'm going to give a break. <laughs> I'm going to go for Robin on this one. Um, Robin, we were talking. You mentioned earlier about testing. How how has the testing sites been going so far here in Shasta County? Yeah, so our new testing sites that we've added, um, we've been working out some kinks with the state staff who run those sites. But um, yeah, people have been scheduling at all of the different locations and getting tested. We are moving. We did move one of our sites recently from uh, the Boggs building on Breslauer to the senior center in Reading. Um, and so that's new, but it's been going well. It was a smooth transition. People have been scheduling appointments there. So yeah, there's still multiple locations available for people to get tested and they just need to go to lhi.care and get registered if you're not already registered. And then you can see all of the different locations and the dates that are available for each. Thank you. And then, you know, um, the importance of testing, you mentioned it earlier, how does testing play a role in getting out of, you know, the purple tier right now? Yeah, so one of the two metrics um, that determines which tier we're in is our test positivity. And so the more people who are getting tested, as opposed to just people who are sick or who've been exposed to someone who's sick, if people are getting tested on a regular basis because they're just out in the community, then it's going to bring our test positivity down because not as many of those people getting tested will be positive. And then the other way that it can impact our tier assignment is there's an adjustment factor to our case rate if our testing volume in our community is higher than the state average, which it usually is. We have um, an adjustment factor on our case rate pretty much every week. Um, this past week, for example, our true case rate was in the 30s, 30 something. I don't have the number off the top of my head. But after the adjustment factor, it came down to 29.9 because of our high rate of testing here in Chasta County compared to the state as a whole. And then what's the number we need to get below again or around to get out of the purple tier when it comes to our uh, case rate? So the case rate would need to be less than seven cases per day per 100,000 population in order to move from the purple tier down to the red. I wanted to add to with the testing. I was recently at the um, Senior Citizens Hall site and people are in and out very quickly. I know that's the same at Shasta College. It's like a five minute process. You walk in, you get tested, you're out the door the way they have the appointments um, scheduled apart. And I know that in the past, 
Um, the return of test results has, has taken some time at certain points throughout this um, pandemic, but we, we know of people who were tested the day before Christmas and got their results back the day after Christmas. And that included, you know, the Christmas holiday in the middle. So, so test results, it's, it's nice to see that those test results are coming back um, within a, a quick amount of time. And appointments are available sometimes same day. So you could know today, if you wanted to go get tested today, you could know in two days whether, um, whether you were positive or not. I have a question for Dr. Randstrom. Um, for people who have had COVID, let's say months ago, what's the advice on both uh, testing and immunization when it becomes available? So as far as vaccination, a person who has been a confirmed case within the last 90 days, they may elect to wait until that 90 day period. That's kind of the time frame that um, we're very, very comfortable that a person would retain immunity. Um, we think that that'll be extended out as more research comes along, but for now that's the current recommendation. A person could elect to go ahead and get vaccinated um, as soon as they're out of that um, period when they're acutely ill and that they are no longer isolated. And the reason for that is that we don't want them going to a clinic when they could potentially still spread it to somebody else. Um, in the long-term care facility setting, um, it's even more um, uh, highly recommended that people just go ahead and get vaccinated as long as they're not acutely ill, um, except for people who are in isolation. And then as far as testing goes, um, the recommendation is that um, if a person um, has symptoms of COVID-19, again, within that 90-day period, um, they can go ahead and get tested again, And um, but they, other causes should be considered, especially right now, such as influenza, right? And so, um, but then if a provider is caring for someone and they cannot identify another cause, um, certainly testing for COVID-19 um, would make sense. And those are some of the the um, the testing if those come back positive that then the state's kind of tracking those um, and it hasn't happened um, often um, but it can um, but those are the recommendations right now. Thank you. You just reminded me uh, the the medical providers out there, uh, primary care medical providers who have point of care testing, almost always invariably have the influenza point of care testing available as well. I don't believe the COVID testing centers do that, right? It's just for COVID, right? That, that is correct. And there also are some multiplex tests that are coming along. So a provider could, if they're sending it to their own um, commercial lab, could order both tests simultaneously if, if they wanted to do that too. Hi there, this is Matt Brandon from the Record Searchlight. I wanted to ask about, um, what our death projections could be. In December, we had 26 deaths, which was the most we've had. And um, there was some association with some of those with Thanksgiving gatherings, I believe, at least with some of the cases. And I wonder, with Christmas having just taken place and New Year's Eve, do we project that January will be worse for deaths than December was? Do we expect to see an equivalent spike like we saw after in the weeks after Thanksgiving, or bigger or smaller? I wasn't sure if we we're going to go or you want me to, Robin. Go for it. Yeah, so I was just going to say, and you're welcome to add if I um, don't touch on the points that you were going to touch on, but it's hard to say. It, you know, our case numbers have been lower the, the last couple of weeks than they had been previously. And so, you know, if you just look at sheer percentages, you know, generally out of X number of cases, a certain percentage will end up hospitalized and of those, a certain number will pass away. Um, so just judging by our low case numbers, it could be, it could mean a decrease in deaths going forward, but we don't know how many cases may be coming in the next couple of weeks because of, as you mentioned, gatherings over the Christmas holidays. So it's a little bit early for us to really be able to project what's gonna happen in January in terms of deaths. Yeah, we, we've seen sort of that predictable, you know, uptake in case rates, then you get an uptick in your hospitalizations and an uptick in our deaths. And, um, we um, are probably gonna have more that are gonna be reported over the next couple of weeks. Um, we've had some preliminary reports. We wait and see the death certificates. And so we know that that, that is the case even right now. Um, I, I'm, most, I'm really concerned about New Year's. And so I would just reiterate Robin's point that please, you know, we are, we are getting close to a place where we can start maybe turning this around. And so 
highly encourage people to just um, celebrate with your household, maybe have a Zoom happy hour celebration or a glass of champagne with, with your uh, remote friends and family. Um, if you recall, Halloween was not great for us. And so I worry that that could happen again. And so we just, you know, really uh, want to people to know that it is still widespread in our community. Um, I think one of our highest case rates was around 60, low 60s, 62, something like that. And now we're down, as Robin said, to about 30 in terms of an adjusted rate, low 30s unadjusted. That is still quite high. And so all areas are risky. And um, we know that um, the place people tend to get it is when they let their guard down, they're around their loved ones and friends. And um, maybe get in a little bit closer and aren't physically distancing and, and masking. So please do take care and um, find a different way to celebrate this year. Dr. Randstrom, um, what, uh, how long does the immunity factors kick in after you get a shot? And my other question, uh, I was reading somewhere that some of the Indian gaming casinos are gearing up for New Year's Eve. I don't know where the ranchery is, is with that, but and I don't know if the state law sort of uh, supersedes their federal protections, but um, do we know anything about whether there's any mass gatherings in our community this Christmas Eve? Well, we can certainly check in with those partners. I hope not. Um, that would be a risky situation, and I hope that the public would understand that's risky and not, not attend. Um, and then your other question, oh, um, so in terms of vaccination, it's expected that the, that the immunity um, is where we want it to be a, a week or two after that second dose. Any other media questions? All right, I'm sorry here, Anna here, just wanted to follow up on one more thing. Um, I had one here, uh, what's the kind of the efficacy of the flu vaccine versus, I don't know if I asked this earlier, so I just wanna get it one more time if I didn't. Um, the efficacy of the flu vaccine versus the COVID vac the three COVID vaccines that we know of so far. So the flu vaccine efficacy um, varies a little bit year to year. I haven't seen any recent data. You know, we will know more as we get into the flu season. Um, oftentimes we know more at the end of the flu season. So, um, but you know, we it, it, the vaccine is updated every single year based on um, on what the trends look like um, in terms of the um, the shift that happened from the prior prior year. And so, you know, it, that's why it's recommended on an annual basis because it changes a little bit every year and is updated. And then for the COVID vaccine, just kind of like, is it because it's kind of new right now and we're only working with this one strain or this another possible strain so that the influenza virus changes much more year to year than the coronavirus changes so the coronavirus has some um small um genetic changes every week or two very small um, there, as you probably have seen in the media, there are some reports recently of, of a strain um, in the UK and just recently identified in the United States that has more than those two or three little shifts in the genetic makeup. Um, and so, but the flu, the influenza virus changes much more so than the coronavirus does in general. And so that's why the influenza virus is updated every year. Thank you, Dr. Ransom, for clarifying that for me. Really appreciate it. And then just one more thing. I wanted to clarify um, what you mentioned earlier for AstraZeneca, since it hasn't been discussed yet, has it on the FDA or the state level at all? Anna, I wanted to, to direct you to our website, ShastaReady.org. If you click on vaccinations, there are a lot of links to lots of information about the vaccine. The, you know, we're, we're the local health department and the, the best place to get the information directly about the vaccine is from CDC. So we would recommend that you that you check out those links. That, that would be a much better place to, to get information about the vaccine. The, other than the, the piece about us distributing it locally, we can answer questions all day long about that. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Hi there, this is Matt again from the Record Search Live. I had two more questions. Um, one is about big events going on. Um, do we know when 
you know, I know we're probably far off from this now still, but when do we think there will be, uh, that it'll be safe to have large gatherings again? I've noticed that while Cool April Nights has been canceled, there have been other groups starting their own sort of versions of it or talking it, starting their own versions. I mean, and that would probably take place around April. Is that safe? Is that too soon to gather? When can, uh, when can people start to feel safe about gathering again? I don't think that we have an exact timeline, but my best guess would be that April is too soon. Um, I think that, you know, we need to make sure that we can get the vaccine out to the general public before we would lift those restrictions around gatherings and things like that. So it's probably not going to be as soon as April. Gotcha. And then um, I also wanted to ask about indoor dining. You know, while indoor dining is off limits in Shasta County, according to the county's website and guidelines, it does seem like there are a lot of restaurants that are still doing indoor dining. And I know there've been efforts to do education with some of them. Are some of these restaurants still having people come to educate them and still being uh, not compliant? And if so, I guess, is there anything that public health can do to try and stop that from happening? Because it does seem like a lot of restaurants are still allowing indoor dining. Yeah, so we are continuing to do education with restaurants and other businesses, either in response to complaints that we get about a specific business or in response to requests from that business for information. Um, and then as far as enforcement, you know, we don't have the authority to enforce those those rules. And so the state organizations as that we've mentioned before, OSHA, and in the case of restaurants, um, generally ABC has jurisdiction over them. So they are doing enforcement. Um, but we don't we don't really do the enforcement piece here at the local level. We are just continuing to provide education. So I guess I wonder what is the uh, response when maybe you do an education session or come by one of these restaurants and they still are hesitant or say that they're not going to make these changes. What what happens in that sort of situation? So we do have a process where um, if we have worked with a business over a long period of time and have provided education and they've engaged with us and said that they're going to make improvements and they don't, then we will refer them to a state agency like OSHA or ABC. Those instances are few and far between because generally when we engage with a business, they want to at least hear the information that we have to share with them and they are willing to make some changes. They don't always come into 100% compliance, but they at least put some uh, risk reduction measures in place. Um, and so that's really, you know, the only next step that we, as I said, very rarely will do with the business is refer them to one of those state agencies. But generally, those agencies are reaching out proactively to businesses. And so we don't have to be the ones to connect them with local businesses. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you everyone for being with us again. Everybody have a safe and healthy New Year celebration and we will see you again uh, next week on Wednesday morning, 11 a.m. Everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank, thank you. you, happy New Year.